And number one is David Bellwood. He's the chief, a chief <coughs> investigator of the ARC at the ARC Center <coughs> of Excellence, which is your host for tonight, of coral reef studies and a distinguished professor of marine biology at James Cook University. He goes into studies of coral reefs and subsequently has used these methods in the evaluation of ecosystem impacts of biodiversity, loss, and climate change. And he's here to tell you, ask not what coral reefs can do for you. David. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robbie. So it's well known that coral reefs are in trouble, and the solutions seem relatively clear. We've got to stop burning fossil fuels, control terrestrial inputs, and stop killing fish, especially the important ones. The big question for me in this is, what's the role of a marine biologist? Um, these days, biologists aren't as cheerful as they used to be. Uh, they're getting increasingly gloomy. Um, we, we talk about reefs, and this is what we, we hope we're talking about, but what they do is they threaten us and they say, uh, well, by 2050, reefs are gonna start looking like this. Now, the, the question that comes to me is, if reefs are looking like that, do we really want to save them? I mean, are they that special anymore? Don't we just rather have another drink and then let them fade into history? So it, that got me asking the question, well, why do I want to work on reefs? What, what uh, was the driver behind all of that? So I've known since I was 14 that I wanted to work on coral reefs. It was innate, it was in there, and I was trying to work out why. Now, I lived in Yorkshire, which might explain something, and I, yes, I did work in the mills uh, at a very young age. Um, and like everybody else, I, I wanted to leave the mills and I, wanted, I had a dream. And I wanted to work on coral reefs. So it, for me, it was the most exciting place in the world. That's where I wanted to be. And I thought, I'll go and have a look. So what I want to do tonight is tell you what I found. So what did I find? Well, the, the first thing I found was that I got seasick. Uh, I wasn't expecting it, but I also discovered along the way, but so do fish. Not in the same way, but fishes have been around, these kind of fishes, for four, these kind, for 400 million years, but it's only in the last 20 million years that they've been able to cope with waves up on the reef flat. That area has been uh, a place they can't get to. So waves are a problem for me and for the fish. I also found that the fish were quite old. So this is kind of a, a cool one that's, it's only found on Lord Howe Island, which is kind of neat for it, but the thing is that that fish is about 11 million years old. Lord Howe Island itself is only about seven. So the fish has been around for longer than the big lump of rock that it lives on behind you. So that kind of stuff I like. And the other thing is that we find that if you look through the past, the coral reef area tends to predict how much biodiversity we've got today. So the last four million years of refuges seem to drive what we see today on reefs in terms of biodiversity. And it's not just this big picture stuff, the small things have equal fascination. So this little goby, um, it only lives for about three weeks on the reef. That's its entire lifespan maximum. In that time, it's got to mature, it's got to uh, reproduce and then change sex. So fast sex is important for these little critters. And that's how I got in the Guinness Book of Records not for the fast sex, for describing these beasts. Um, now, that kind of problem isn't just small fishes. Big fishes have the same kind of deal. This is a fish that's on the barrier reef. It's about a meter long. In 35 years of diving, myself and all the other professors at James Cook, we've not seen any more than 10 babies. These things just don't seem to produce babies on the barrier reef. The suggestion is that these fishes are all swimming down from Papua New Guinea. Kind of weird, but that's what it appears to be happening. Uh, in terms of talking babies, it's, it's now looking like something over 20 years since we discovered these fish were able to swim. These are little butterfly fish about the size of your fingernail. They can swim 36 kilometers in a single bout. That's part of the reason they can get back to reefs. And we've also found at this time that the fastest fish in the world is a newly hatched anemone fish. So they do come out, and as soon as they hatch out, more body lengths per second from an anemone fish than any other fish in the world. They're, they're super athletes. So we know there's lots of things in terms of the young, but to show that there's more to it than just sex and reproduction, we can look at rabbit fishes. These are a good example. These were in the newspapers recently. They seem to pair for life. 
And when they're doing that, they watch out for each other. So the, the phrase is they watch each other's back. So as one's feeding, the other one's looking out to make sure they don't get eaten. But it's kind of interesting that when we looked at these, 25% of the pairs were homosexual. So they weren't worrying about sex. Eat first, worry about the rest later. So they've got some kind of, well, I was going to say they've got their priorities right, perhaps not. Anyway, um, rabbit fish are also interesting. They're the first herbivorous fish that was found to eat at night. So these things sleep in the day. When everything else goes to sleep, they sneak out and they go and have a feed. And uh, whilst they're feeding, these things are asleep. It's a parrotfish. fish. It's well known. They're in their cocoon. But we've used acoustic telemetry to find out that they're actually warmer than the surrounding seas. So somehow, internally, they keep themselves warm. We don't know how they do it. It's just interesting. And this thing, this is, it produces a ton of feces a year. And I calculated that. That's like you producing three buckets of sand a day. Um, you can imagine why this is the only fact of mine that's gone to the TV program QI. So <laughs> they're a kind of neat beast. Um, but we've also learned at the same time in terms of what fishes are doing, we've only recently discovered why fish like to be under corals. They're not there to avoid predation, they're hiding from the sun. They don't want to get UV stress, they're avoiding uh, skin cancer basically. So we've learned huge amounts of things about the fishes, but we've also learned things about ourselves. So we now know that spearfishers are some of the best conservationists you're going to come across. They see the world changing. They're aware to what's happening, and they warn us before things get too bad. The scientists have to catch up. So our lesson is to learn from them. And the other thing that we're learning is that things like this, parrotfishers, they're great for keeping the reef clean, but they're also important for humans. About 200 million people depend on them for food. They're critically important for the reef and for us, not to mention the billions of dollars in tourist dollars that come out of looking at these things on the reef. So the bottom line is that these things are fascinating. We've learned a lot about the animals. We've learned a lot about ourselves. But this is just a fraction of what we know. So all of this information has come from one small lab with a handful of good students in a provincial university. We know so much more about reefs now. They really are the most fascinating place in the world. That's the reef, not Townsville. So <laughs> it, you know, that is why I wanted to work on reefs, and that is why uh, I still want to do it to this day. So the question is then, what can marine biologists and scientists in general do for the reefs? We're not able to save the reefs by ourselves. What that is going to require is politicians who will make the right decisions. <laughs> Physicists who are going to be able to get alternative energy sources cheaply, and people like this guy who can show us how to change directions sometimes. That's the kind of thing we need. We need leadership. We need strong leadership in the right direction. But what are we going to use marine biologists for, well, what I believe they can do, far better, I would argue, than anybody else in the world, is to say why reefs are worth saving. Because that's what we've got to do. We mustn't lose the target, which is to keep reefs alive. And if we keep reefs going, we may just inadvertently save ourselves. Thank you.